Good evening, everybody. Good to see you. So tonight is our Ask with Forum with David Johns, and I'll introduce David in a minute. Um, you all know that the Ask with Forums are a series of public lectures that bring leaders to in the field to share new knowledge, to generate spirited conversation, and to offer insight into the highest priority challenges facing education. This is the last Ask with Forum for this semester. And please visit www.gse.harvard.edu slash askwith for information about upcoming forums, videos of past forums, EdCast interviews, and to opt in to receive the Ask With newsletter. So I'm going to introduce David, but first I want to tell you a little bit about our friendship. Uh, I actually went on my emails today, and I've been yelled at by the email gurus because I keep all my emails. I'm not even going to tell you how many I have stored uh, on my computer. But I put in David's name because I knew I had the first email he sent me, and I did. And it was from uh, fall of 2010. And this was when the Senate Help Committee, uh, of which David was the senior staffer for Senator Harkin, was actually thinking about reauthorizing ESEA. And so he sent me an email and asked me what was the definition of family engagement. And from that day on, he and I have been having tons of conversations. We actually met finally at AERA in New Orleans, had dinner, and have been fast friends ever since. And so I have to say I'm honored that he's here tonight, and I think you're going to find this Ask With Forum very exciting. So David is now the executive director of the White House Initiative on Educational Excellence for African Americans at the U.S. Department of Education. He works to identify evidence-based best practices to improve African American student achievement from cradle to career. Prior to joining the Department of Education, David was a senior education policy advisor to the Senate Committee on Health, Education, Labor, and Pensions under the leadership, as I mentioned, of Senator Tom Harkin from Iowa. John served under the leadership of the late Senator Ted Kennedy. John's was also a Congressional Black Caucus Foundation Fellow in the office of Congressman Charles Rangel of New York. His research as an Andrew W. Mellon Fellow served as a catalyst to identify, disrupt, and supplant negative perceptions of black males, both within academia and society. And David maintains an active commitment to improve literacy among adolescent minority males. And one of the things that I know is that David is very passionate about the field of education. He graduated with honors from Columbia University with a triple major in English, creative writing, and African American studies, and also obtained a master's degree in sociology and educational policy at Teachers College, Columbia University, while simultaneously teaching kindergarten and third grade uh, at schools in New York City. And uh, John's graduated summa cum laude uh, from uh, Teachers College. So with that, without further ado, I'd like to invite my friend David John's up to the podium. Good evening. We're going to try that one more time because other than the fact that I'm a child of God, the most important thing is that I taught elementary school. So good evening. Good evening. There we go. A little community. Um, so let me start by saying thank you for this invitation. I'm especially excited to be here. The last time I was in this room was for repairing the breach conference that one of your um, classmates and colleagues um, um, helped to organize, Dorian. Um, he's not in the room, but his spirit is still here. Um, so I'm especially excited to be here. Uh, before I say another word, however, I'd like to just take a moment um, to observe the lives that have been lost um, in this past year. Anybody who knows me, aside from knowing that I'm always talking about teaching the babies, knows that I have gotten very little sleep. Um, and this last week in particular, um, because in addition to Mike Brown and Trayvon Martin and Renisha McBride and so many others whose names we will never know, um, in this last week alone, we've lost two more children that we've been mourning nationally, right? So I'll talk a little bit about my brother who was just shot. But then last night, some of you might have heard that there was a young Latino brother in Miami who was shot and killed after having purchasing some headphones and walking to school. Um, so before we get into the presentation, if we could just have a moment of silence.
Thank you for that. So I want to take um, um, a little bit of time and set some context. If nothing else, when you leave here, you will have a better appreciation for the work of the White House Initiative on Educational Excellence for African Americans. Uh, but I really want you all to be prepared for a conversation. Everybody say conversation about what it is that we can be doing together to make this stuff more active. I told y'all I was a teacher. It's going to come out at some point. Once a teacher, always a teacher. Um, so why don't we start uh, by acknowledging the importance of why we are here. Um, so at, below this picture is a quote that is often recited by the president, the first lady, and the secretary of education, which is that in this country, one founded on the fundamental premise and promise of liberty and equality for all and justice for all and fair treatment, and if you work hard, you just get it, all of the things that we sometimes take for granted is sometimes decided by one's zip code or genetic code. And in an environment where education is a prerequisite for being able to be fully engaged and to be successful in our society, we must ask ourselves, why is it that some communities are almost always locked out of or face significant barriers in gaining access to the types of opportunities they need? So the White House initiatives on educational excellence for African Americans, many of you have never heard of the term before you saw the flyer for tonight's forum. Don't worry, I won't ask you to identify yourselves. Uh, but suffice it to say that uh, this is not a, a, a new thing. Um, this initiative that I have the pleasure of serving on is the newest of now six similarly situated initiatives that are designed to be GLUE. I'll talk a little bit more about GLUE, but typically people think about the federal government and work in DC as belonging to one of three spaces. Right, are the three branches of government, what are they? Executive. A little louder. <laughs> Legislative, executive, oh. and judicial. However, there's one group that's often absent from that, but is essential to all of that, and it's the community with the capital C. And the work that we do is often to make sure that the dots are connected between each of those things. And so the eldest of the initiatives is the White House Initiative on HBCUs, or Historically Black Colleges and Universities, established under Carter. There was also a White House initiative focused on educational excellence for Hispanics, one focused on Native Americans, Alaska Natives, and Hawaiians, one focused on Asian American, Pacific Islanders, and one also focused on faith-based neighborhood community engagement. I have the pleasure of serving on the initiative that was established under this administration. So sometimes people like to question whether or not our black president cares about black people. You can offer my initiative and the executive order as a hashtag receipt. I say that because there was incredible energy and equity that was required to establish this initiative. A lot of that was owned by the members of the Congressional Black Caucus, who looked at the data that many of you are all too familiar with and identified that if we look at most quality of life indicators in terms of education and workforce development, children of color, not just all of them, but brown and black children of color are often at the lowest rungs. And so this initiative exists to be unapologetic, and as intentional as we possibly can be about leveraging federal resources to close those gaps. Now, I was asked to answer three questions tonight, so I'm not gonna bury the lead. This is what we're gonna get into, and then Karen and I are gonna extrapolate and have a bit more conversation. But three of the most powerful lessons that I've learned since I've been doing this work are as follows. One, children, especially disadvantaged children of color, are especially resilient. The sad reality is that they should not have to be. The second realization is that we, and when I mean we, I'm talking about y'all in this room. Let's be clear. We have an obligation to speak full truth to power. My professor, Manny Marable at Columbia, God rest his soul, used to always say that we are required to speak full truth to power, especially when it shakes your soul. The third thing is that we must listen to young people and give them the gift of listening. And not the listening because you know what it is they're gonna say because you've been through that space before and can tell them how to do it right, but listening authentically. Acknowledging that in the years since you passed through that age bracket, a whole lot has already changed. So the first one, children are especially resilient, but they should not have to be. We'll talk a little bit about the context within which we're all sitting in this space right now. But the reality is that for far too many children in this country, when asked a question like, what do you want to be when you grow up? The answer is not a doctor or a lawyer, or a policeman or a mother. For some, it is simply being alive. And the reality is that there are some kids in communities across this country, not just the major metropolitan spaces that we talk about on the nightly news, 
but in small rural and isolated communities across this country too. But there are kids that on the way to school experience events that would break the average adult, right? I'm talking about kids who know intimately the consequences of prolonged exposure to poverty, our toxic stress, our trauma. Consider this, Michael Brown was shot on a Saturday and his body lay in the middle of the street for hours. There are children who were in classes with him who had to walk by the same place where his body rested. Those same babies then had to go to school on Monday. Many of them, without the necessary mental health support, they need to even acknowledge what happened, let alone to unpack it and then be able to move to a space where they can then focus and learn and demonstrate all the stuff that we expect them to do. But sometimes we forget all of that, that they come into school with a whole lot of stuff that they've already experienced, some of them not being able to focus because they can't see the board, or not being able to sit still because they're hungry and haven't eaten at night, or have not slept. Or how about our homeless kids that we sometimes forget don't have the privilege of a network of support that many of us sometimes take for granted? The point here is that even in these moments, our babies show up for us and try and aspire to the goals that we have for them, sometimes without complaining. The point here is that we need to acknowledge it, show up for them, and find ways to account for the ways that the world will impact them as they move through these spaces that are designed to support them. Before we get into a little bit of the challenges, let's do some celebration, right? We tend to come into these spaces and only talk about the negative things. So I want to celebrate and introduce you to a couple of my friends. This is a young brother named Corey. How many of you have ever heard of Corey? All right, so not enough. Some of you have heard of Corey. Corey is a CEO with a capital C, a capital E, and a capital O. He makes cookies in New York. It is a, 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 a enterprise that has netted him uh, quite a bit of money, and the boy is also sartorially sophisticated. When asked what makes his cookies different, he says that they're all natural and they're made with love. Thessalonica Embry graduated from college at the age of 14. She was in middle school and was bored. And her mother at the time had the thought that not all of our mothers have, which is to put her in community college. When that was me, when I was bored, I got in trouble because I used to run my mouth, right? But this young lady graduated from college and when asked what she was looking forward to, she said making new friends when she transitioned to a space where she could continue to learn. This is Mo. Mosiah lives in Memphis and runs a business that is valued at more than $200,000 today. He makes bow ties and pocket squares. And when I asked him what his inspiration was for his business, he talked about his grandmother, the first STEM professional that he ever met which is important because sometimes when you ask little black kids or brown kids if they know a STEM professional, they say no. Why? Because they're looking for the white man in the lab coat. But Mosiah knew and appreciated that his mother used the machine to make clothes, leveraging technology to make things work. And the boy is also sharp. Check out his website. This is Malika. I met her recently in Texas. Malika is nine years old. She's an entrepreneur and an activist. She uses her mother's, our grandmother's flaxseed oil recipe to make some of the sweetest lemonades you've ever tasted in your life. She is the youngest CEO ever to be purchased and included in Whole Foods. Think about being this brother's age. How old are you, sir? Nice. Let me give you a round of applause for just being in this space. Stand up and take a bow. He's why we're here. We're proud of you. So this young man is the same age as this young woman. Just imagine for a second what it might mean for him, and we can ask him because he's here, but what it might mean for him in a world in which in the last week all of the references to him and his friends have been around what? Mike Brown, Evander Myers, and Trayvon Martin. Death and destruction. Imagine the feeling of just walking through Whole Foods and seeing this beautiful girl smile on the face. It must do something to you. And it's not just for the babies, too. Imagine walking in with your uncle or aunt who's not quite as friendly as you want to admit. <laughs> At a minimum, they might ask a question about what she's doing and why. Right? I celebrate these babies because they're not necessarily exceptions. They're brilliant kids. 
there's always been brilliant kids of color, right? I'm acknowledging, however, that our natural inclination is to not tell their stories. It's to dwell in the space of the exceptional. But we have to honor that each of our babies are born with the promise of full potential. Because of the three doctors, we can be our brother's keeper, stay focused, and work to succeed together. So this video always makes me smile for uh, two reasons, and this was uh, produced by a good friend named Unique Jones, who started this campaign called Because of Them, to connect young people, as well as adults, to the, the, the figures that we sometimes only celebrate in February, but who are there to remind us uh, who we are and whose we are. Um, but aside from being uh, uh, reminded of what it was like to be in morning circle in my kindergarten class, uh, this video is a reminder that, again, all of our children have and are born with an extreme amount of potential. The question we might ask ourselves is, what happens when that potential is not fully realized? And so, again, with this theme of powerful lessons learned about improvement is that we must speak full truth to power. So the reality is that, yes, there are some significant barriers that young kids of color face and their desire to demonstrate that they are academically excellent, but that's only part of the story, right? So let's start there. These are some statistics from an essay that I contributed to the National Black Child Development Institute State of the Black America Report. And it highlights that there's a disproportionate impact uh, of the policies that exist within schools and in the criminal justice system that impacts black kids. Um, so this is, uh, shouldn't be a surprise to many of you, but in Wisconsin, uh, black high school students are 10 times um, as likely not to advance to the next grade uh, compared to their white counterparts. Um, I'm not going to read all of these, but the point is that there are some significant barriers. Um, the Department of, of um, Justice and the Department of Education's Offices of Civil Rights produced for the first time in the history of our country data that quantifies many of the challenges that people have known about anecdotally for quite some time. Um, significant in that are a few things. One, um, black kids, um, students with disabilities, and students who fall into the LGBTQ category, which is important for us to acknowledge because far too often when we talk about black or brown things, our boys and girls, we don't acknowledge that there are kids who don't fit neatly within those buckets or boxes, right? Uh, but kids who fall into those categories face the most hurdles to being academically successful, period. Need examples? Black boys, before they start kindergarten, are more likely to be suspended or expelled than they are in all of K-12 combined. Think about it for a second. All the stuff you know that's true about dropout rates in high school, it starts real early. And the point that I'm just making for some of you that's really new is that black kids are being taken out of the opportunity to run the race before they're even officially supposed to start, right? It's just true. But that's only part of the story. The rest of the story is that in spite of that, there are still students who go to school face those barriers, and find ways to show out anyway. Period. We must tell the whole truth. And in doing so, we have to ask ourselves a couple of questions. Are we worthy of our children? We spend a whole lot of time talking about them, but never really thinking about or interrogating our relationship to them. And when thinking about why these problems are important and why it matters for us to even think about interrogating them is, what does it feel like for so many of our students to go through spaces where you feel like things are unfair, period. Ask yourself, what does it feel like to be a child, a poor minority child in America today? And I mentioned a couple of these names, but I think it's important for us to spend a little bit of time here. Uh, for too many of our kids, the reality is that who they are is not what everybody sees, 
period. We spend a whole lot of time having popular conversations about the politics of respectability. Some people like to suggest that if little black boys and girls just pulled their pants up that there would be no issues. I remind you that there have been people that have been killed in full suits and are uh, sometimes when people try and buy belts, they're even arrested. Some of you won't get that joke, but it'll come back. There's a brother from the Y who tried to buy a belt and was arrested. And the reality is that for too many of our kids, this idea of not being able to fully realize your potential is not a figurative one, it's a literal one. Tamir Rice, last week, at 12 years of age, was shot on a playground by the police after a 911 call, and it's on video. Shardavia Jenkins, at nine, was killed in the crossfire of a dispute. Vonderett Myers, almost to the day that Mike Brown was shot and killed, was shot more than 16 times. Sakia Gunn was 15 when a man accosted her on the street to try and proposition her. When she said that she wasn't interested and he kept pushing, she finally said, I'm a lesbian. He shot her in front of her friends. Mackenzie Elliott was three and was sitting on her porch in Baltimore when she was hit by a stray bullet. And Rakia Bird, at 22, was shot by an off-duty cop. She was but an innocent bystander. Now, this is important because there are times in our country where we all stop to mourn the loss of one of our babies. But the reality is that at the time that I have stood before you, we've lost a couple of our kids. And it's a problem that we must deal with. One of the ways that we can address these challenges and grapple with the reality that our children are sometimes forced to deal with things that we don't even want to acknowledge is to listen to them. Uh, one of the most uh, significant uh, partnerships that we've um, um, engaged in and that I celebrate is a partnership with Ebony Magazine. Ooh, time, okay. Uh, Ebony Magazine, Jobson Publishing Company, uh, they've allowed us to produce four summits across this country that have allowed young people to speak their own truth to power. We uh, held the most recent of these summits in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania last month at University of Pennsylvania. And the theme that ran consistently throughout each of the panels was young people saying they want love. And these are high school kids who are saying to a bunch of adults, I need you to ask me where I'm going, what I'm doing, and who I'm doing it with. Now here's the catch. They weren't extending this invitation to everybody because many of you know that young people don't care what you know until they what? Know that you care. What they're asking is for us to put our bodies on them, to get in the way, but to do so in ways that align with us demonstrating to them that we care, that we see them that we're gonna be honest about the mistakes that we've made trying to do this thing called life in the way that they're doing it too, and that we're gonna support them as they grow. These are pictures from those summits, um, and just, a, again, a powerful example of what it means to see young people in spaces where they typically are only referenced in name only. Um, I'm gonna play a little bit of this video, but this is another 11-year-old boy. The point here is that um, we often talk about uh, needing to figure stuff out, um, most of what's happening across this country, we've known for quite some time, right? Um, people often say teaching is a rock in science. They're right, it's a lot harder. But most of the stuff that's working, especially for children of color, um, has been working for quite some time. So let's listen to Marcus talk a little bit um, about what he thinks needs to happen in order for this stuff to change. We need to diversify. Um, we need a more diverse government. We need to make sure that uh, people uh, of minority or get a chance to uh, serve on police departments. We also need better educations for the people in North County. That's not being solved. And that's why I'm here today to tell you that, that the real issues aren't being solved, that you're paying attention to the wrong things. You're paying attention to the looting and things like that when the real issues aren't being solved. There's a reason why those people are out there. I also wanna say that we need to, um, what I mean by diversifying is mean uh, where are all the African-American police officers in our community? Uh, when we have a majority African-American community and we have majority 
white police um, departments were all the African American police officers. And why do we have um, mostly people of ma the major majority working in our neighborhoods? Why don't we have people that are our color working in our neighborhoods? It's not right that we have people uh, why, that we can't get a job in our own neighborhoods, that we have people who are white working in our own neighborhoods. It's not right that we can't even get a job in our own neighborhoods. Thank you. So uh, this brother is 11 and speaks with clarity that, a lot, that escapes a lot of adults. Uh, now, let me be clear. This is not a black-white thing. I have heard some of the most hurtful things said to black people come out of the mouths of or it's said about black hair come out of the mouths of black people, right? The adage usually is, all my skin folk ain't my kin folk. And there are so many students who will never encounter a professional of color while they are in school, right? So we need to do two things in this moment. One, acknowledge all of the educators who commit their lives to doing God's work, period, right? But the second thing, and this is what Marcus is saying, is we need to have honest conversations about why there are not more of us in the spaces in which our kids need to see us. So I think about this as a kindergarten teacher, there was not a single black boy in my class. There was actually not a single black boy in the grade. Think about it, 56 kids all thinking about what it's gonna be like when they grow up and there's not a black boy factored into that picture. Layer on top of that, the images that get recycled in popular media. Think about it for a second. You're five years old, trying to make sense of and imagine your life as an adult and there's not a black boy in that picture at all. That has to do something to you. And I think often about the moment when Michael Dunn and Jordan Davis were engaged in whatever conversation they engaged in in that parking lot. And what I like to think is that if Michael had seen a man of color at some point in his life conspiring for his success, he might have had a different response. So we need to listen to young people like Marquise who ask why we don't show up in the spaces in which we should and why there aren't more of us who are working together to support young kids who look like everybody in this room. I'm gonna go through five things that have been really essential and hopefully we can talk through this more. Um, one, learning starts at birth and a preparation for learning starts well before birth. Too many people start these conversations at kindergarten. Some of y'all even started at high school. But the reality is, and if anybody has questions, you can go talk to Jack Sharkaw. The reality is that, what, Narasa neighborhood, you love it, right? Learning starts at birth and the preparation starts well before that. Why do we spend all this time trying to play catch up when we can take advantage of the time when the foundation upon which all future learning and development is being formed? It baffles me. And I invite anybody that has questions about how important that period is to go spend time in somebody's pre-kindergarten program. I, my life changed the moment I understood how early young people start to make sense of the world around them. And here's the reality, they give it to you straight, right? When you become an adult and you start being worried about the politics of respectability, you start saying obfuscating stuff and not speaking full truth to power, you want some honesty? Spend time in the morning circle with some kindergartners. The second thing is this, learning is essential and literacy is the tool that enables you to do that. And I'm not talking about just being able to read, but I'm uh, read a book I'm talking about being able to manage a checkbook. I'm talking about being able to read a script so you understand what's required to be whole, healthy, and happy. And the reality is that too many of our babies can't read. And I'm not gonna do the third grade reading levels and the eighth grade reading levels. I even question the statistics about building prisons on reading levels. But what I will say is this, there are too many adults who are functionally illiterate. One thing that the My Brother's Keepers Task Force report hit upon was the importance of literacy. There are too few kids of color who don't see books that affirm the parts of their identities. Period. There are too many who move through spaces where they don't even see books, digitally or otherwise. And we, some of my black folks right now, get embarrassed by the fact that there are people in our families and our communities that can't read when the reality is that we come from people who risk their lives to learn to read by candlelight and moonlight. And if I can read, everybody I know should be able to read. This is one of those spaces where we'll talk about the importance of government resources, but this is one of those where that's not required. Instead of talking about the woman on the pew as you move past her on Sunday, invite her to read. 
instead of being embarrassed about the fact that your nephew can't read the prayer at Thanksgiving, spend time teaching him or her how to read. And do it intergenerationally. Fun for the whole family, I promise. The third thing, post-secondary success must be celebrated and supported from birth. So here's my new thing on this. We, people of color, got to get past talking about you just got to go to college. No, you actually have to get through. Yeah. Let, me, let me say this so we're clear. I'm not one of those people who believes that college is not for everybody. In fact, it pisses me off when people suggest that because the first people who are excused are poor minority people. And in a world where the term minority is incorrect because we are the majority, we got to figure out how to solve that problem. A part of that is institutions like Harvard and Columbia and the rest of the Ivies and the research institutions that lead this country's thinking need to grapple with this challenge of serving and supporting students who weren't welcomed here. Let's just name it, because a part of this tonight is having tough conversations. And if you can't have it in a space like Harvard, then where can you? I see it, Karen. I see it. I, I, I promise I see it. <laughs> so the second point of this is that we have to reframe how it is that people think about college. This isn't just about us. It took me graduating from Columbia to realize that I was exceptional. Not just because I worked really hard to demonstrate that I was smart, but because I graduated in four years. Y'all know this. The vast majority of your friends are on that five, six, sometime plan. Here's the other thing that bothers me. Some of us move through spaces talking about college as if Ivy's are the only way that you can get a credential of value. When the reality is that community colleges serve a significant percentage of not only minorities, but veterans, adults who are trying to get back into the game, and people who need the support. So we have to do a better job of acknowledging and celebrating the value that a certificate, credential, or a degree provides. And my thing is this, this goes someplace. Hundreds of thousands of institutions across this country, I'm sure there's one just for you. And the question Harvard is, what are you going to do again to support students who were not intended to be here? Who some still don't think deserve to be here. We'll have that conversation too. I saw this this morning and it made me cry. Um, this is, um, uh, I imagine he teaches kindergarten or somewhere like that because, you know, babies, again, keep it honest. But if you can't read it in the back, it says it's a conversation with the butterflies. I'm sure what he refers to his students as or she refers to her students as. Um, and that's a picture of Michael Brown. It's not the image that uh, is on Fox News. Um, but the first question is, what do you notice about this person? He's graduating. He has a diamond hat. He has something red around his neck. He has brown skin. He has a green jacket and he has a white shirt. Does anybody know who this is? Everyone says no. But if you saw this person on the street, what would you do? Say hi. Say him if, if he was going to get hit by a car. Walk to him. Give him a high five. Buy him some cake. Whoever that is, is my kind of child. Tell him congratulations. Invite him into the classroom or give him a handshake. This is how we all start, people. Just pure. You just want to love. I tell people all the time, you can't have a bad day as an elementary school teacher. Try being pissed off around a bunch of five-year-olds. It's not going to last long. They just want to enroll you in this process of figuring stuff out. But somewhere along the way, we get caught up and consumed in the stuff that occupies adults and forget to continue to nurture this until they themselves are able to nurture it and pay it forward. We need to spend more time celebrating the unexpected. I often think, think about this. Think about this for a second. Imagine how different our country would be if we spent half the energy, just half, maybe even a quarter, celebrating those who participate in academic decathlons, who like speech and debate, who choose DECA over dance. Imagine how different things would be if we celebrated them almost as much as we celebrate those who dribble balls and sing songs. Now listen, let's be clear. Anybody who watches my Twitter feed on Thursday knows that I love television. I live tweet Scandal and Real Housewives. I get into all of it. So this isn't about that. But it should make you feel some kind of way when you move through spaces and the people who are celebrated aren't doctors who save lives, aren't educators who ensure that everybody has the ability to be a professional. 
Just today, I was in an airport, and Channing Tatum is on the cover of Esquire's Most Interesting People of the Millennium. I had never met Channing in my life. I have nothing bad about Listen. But I asked myself, what it would mean for somebody who's, who come to this planet to pick that up, and, 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 and that's the signal we said, that the most thoughtful and interesting people are those who entertain us, and some might even say distract us from the things that we need to be doing. There was a young man who asked the secretary during the bus tour in, in Birmingham, why is it that there are doctors who cure can or attempting to cure cancer and who spend lifetimes trying to save people, and educators who can't pay their bills while people get paid millions of dollars to dribble balls and sing songs. And this is especially important, an important time in which the most popular television show on network television today is what? This is participatory. What is it? Nope, not scandal. See? <laughs> Shout out to Shonda, though. Huh? Nope, not even football. It's American Idol, people. It's American Idol, and probably Dancing with the Stars thereafter. <laughs> but that means something, especially at a point in time in which you don't have a different world of the Cosby show to remind you that going to college with a bunch of smart black people is possible and cool. Or that there are mothers and fathers who are working together, or mothers and mothers, or fathers and fathers, or grandmothers and uncles who are working together to support their families. These visual cues matter, especially at a point in time in which our children are often bombarded with particular messages. So this is a young man that I met in Miami, I'm gonna wrap this up, Karen, I promise, who was shot on the way to school earlier this year. Miami Gardens is located right behind a project where it, the biggest claim to fame is that they produce Trick Daddy and Trina and they send a whole lot of black boys to the NFL every year. It's, it's a community where if you are a little black boy, the thing you wanna do is play football because it is a tangible way out. Honestly, this boy is like 5'2". If I dunked him in that water, he might be 70 pounds soaking wet. And when I met him, he said he wanted to play football before he was introduced to this aquaponics system. Aquaponics is hydroponics, which is this, which is physically grown by the ammonia of the fish. Nitrite, which turns into nitrate, and that is good for the um, fishes. It's good for the fish and the plants. And the reason why our water is green is because of the algae. So we leave it green like this until it filters out. And the good thing about this system is it's a closed system, so all we have to do is feed it. So the, the reality is that most people don't know what those words mean, especially if you didn't major in the science. Uh, but this young man has a sophisticated understanding of agriculture that is literally turning a food desert into a food forest. He understands crops and how they're working and feeding villages and doing amazing things. He's not exceptional, right? The exceptional thing is that he's been given access to the resources needed to be um, to demonstrate how, how brilliant he is. Uh, two more things, support, learning, and development is village work. We often talk about it takes a village, uh, but for far too long we've let the village idiots do this work, so I'm asking y'all to think about how you see yourself in the village. Um, and then the last thing is we must reframe the narrative. Um, so this one's really important. We'll talk some more about it with Karen, but I'd like to remind people about this. There are lots of adages that people like to offer that aren't based in anything, let alone reality. Right? So I said one of them earlier, people often say that teaching isn't rocket science, and again, next time you hear it, tell them they're right, it's a lot harder. And I have a NASA scientist on record saying that if you need the evidence to say hashtag receipt. The second thing is this, people say there are more black men in prison than in college. Raise your hand if you've heard that. The reality is that it's a lie. We question whether or not the statistic has ever been real. But here's what happens. People recite it, they don't ever even think to fact check it. And then in spaces where they're then encountering these young men, that barrier is erected. I watched it happen. Those who believe that kids are going to end up dead or in jail anyway can take themselves off the hook of doing a tough work and meeting this child where he or she is. You don't have to figure out the music he purports to like because he's going to end up dead anyway. You don't have to understand her and the world she inhabits because she's going to go to jail anyway. Or if we're being real, she's going to be trafficked. That's what's really happening in our country today. We have to be thoughtful about the things that we say and the images that we recycle because they impact our kids. They have a real powerful way of challenging them to question who they are and whose they are. And they have an equally powerful effect on coloring the way that we see our babies. There are two more questions that I didn't answer at all. I'm gonna skip this video. 
Um, but this will, will segue into the conversation with Karen. So the, th this is advice for institutions like Harvard, um, period. So there are three things, and the thing that connects them is that this is difficult work. I want to honor that. We're, gonna, we're not going to bury the lead, period, full stop. So what? So what? People don't like to talk about race. They don't like to talk about class. They definitely don't like to talk about the confluence of the two. Adults in graduate school who've been told you're smart and you're brilliant don't like to be questioned or challenged. We don't like to sit in the discomfort of sometimes having to ask the question that nobody in the room wants to ask. Or having to do the work of explaining exactly what you mean and why you said it. But if not you, then who? If not now, when? And if not at Harvard, where? Although Columbia would do it. <laughs> uh, last piece, advice for individuals interested in policy. Three things. One, accept that policy impacts all things. So if you do not see yourself as somebody who needs to think about policy, you are wrong. Acknowledging that the question is, how are you going to leverage your privilege? That which you inherited or that which you worked for? I challenge all of you to accept and acknowledge that you have something to contribute to this work. You don't have to stand up in a classroom every day, but you can find some way to show up in the lives of a young person. Understand the relationship between policy and practice. It does you a disservice and this institution a disservice if you only talk to yourselves. I get tired of going to spaces where people end up honoring their friends. That's cute, but played. You need to make it meaningful. If your conversations aren't with the community that's impacted by what you're studying or purport to care about, then you're wasting your time. If you don't find new ways of engaging in old conversations, then you should just give it up. And if you don't mean what you say, a lot of people talk about wanting to engage parents. You can invite them to the dance, but if you're not going to dance with them, save the invitation. Make it meaningful. Make it count. And show it with both your head and your heart. The last thing I'll say is this. It's an incredibly tough work. I am privileged to do it. I think about it all the time. A little black boy from Inglewood, California, non-nuclear like family. It's cool to walk into spaces like Harvard and be celebrated for being a nerd. When I was young, bro, when I was your age, being a nerd was the fastest way to get my, your starter jacket stolen. A starter jacket is kind of like an iPod <laughs> in terms of... Level of importance. You got that? That makes sense? Okay, good. Sometimes it's hard. My niece was asking me about pages the other day, and I was at a loss. So the point I'm making is this. Y'all are the chosen ones. This school isn't the sexy school on this campus, right? Let's be real. It's, it's, I mean, y'all are sexy people, but I'm saying the school <laughs> is not what gets celebrated, right? But you're here. For whatever reason, you've decided to ignore all of the people that looked at you like you were crazy when you said, I'm going into education. So make it count. There are so many children across this country who simply need to know that somebody sees them and cares about them. And there are six initiatives that are housed in the White House that are here to support whatever it is that you decide to do to make some meaningful and sustained commitment to our students, our schools, and our country. I challenge you to take me up on my invitation to work with you to do something real so that the next time we come together to have this conversation, it'll be a completely different topic on a completely different tone. And if you hear me say nothing else because Aunt Maya spirit often reminds me that people will forget what you said. Some of y'all will forget what I do except I get to work for the president, which is pretty cool. But if I've done my job right, you won't forget the way that I've made you feel. And if you feel nothing else, feel something for the kids who wake up in the morning questioning why they should go through it anyway. Don't just do this for the kids that make it easy, who will do backflips through a library just to make you smile. Do it for the kids you want to shake, because they're the ones that are demanding love from you. Thank you.
Thank you, David. So here's what we're going to do. Um, the staff is going to set up the um, chairs and table. And what I'd like to do is to challenge you to talk to your neighbor while we do that. I'd like you to talk to your neighbor about what is the one thing that David has said tonight that's really stuck with you. And I'd also like you to think about a question that you might want to ask when we do the Q&A. So I'd like you to do a turn and talk, talk to your neighbor, introduce yourself to your neighbor while we set up, OK? Hmm. I want to hear what they're saying. Yes. I should put this down. Thank you, Mary. Okay. All right, if we have the mic back on, please, if it's not already. So I want to ask David a few questions, and then what we'll do is we'll turn it over to the audience. I'd like to try to give us at least a half hour for Q&A, because I find that a lot of times when we do the Ask With forums, uh, we only have maybe 15 minutes for Q&A, and that's a little tough. Uh, can I say this as well? Um, I didn't do this, but I am addicted to social media. Uh, hashtag teach the babies, and I'm at Mr. David John. So if you have a question that you don't want to ask in this form or we run out of time, if you pose it on Twitter, I uh, commit to responding. OK. And he's not kidding. He's a Twitter monster. I can't because black kids are oversubscribed on Twitter. They're doing it for the vine, and you need to meet the babies where they are. That's right. <laughs> I'm surprised you're not tweeting right now. I thought about it. I know you did. OK, so the first question I want to ask you, David, is you know, when I think about your, your past, and you know, a lot of our students are finishing up now. We're in, in final season. And they're going to be thinking about courses that they should take or experiences that they should engage in next semester to do this work, this hard work that you talked about tonight. So when you think about your career at Teachers College, is there anything that you wish you had done there, wish you had taken while you were there as a graduate student that might have prepared you for this work? Uh, good question. Uh, two things come to mind. Um, one, uh, Teachers College is often talked about as a, um, an institution that is very heavy in theory and light on practice. And one of the most um, helpful things to me in the course of my early career, or young career, um, has been having practical experience. Um, being able to cut through um, what anybody can find in a research study to justify their opinion by grounding it in what would work in a classroom or what wouldn't work in a community. Uh, made all the difference in the world. And so I remind people that being able to speak from that position of authority, understanding what is happening in school systems or the spaces you seek to impact um, is important. Um, it's not required, but it's important. Um, and in particular for um, young professionals of color, um, it is incredibly important. It allows you to cut through a lot of the ceilings that will exist for reasons that we can talk about as well. Um, with regard to classes, um, I would have liked if, um, to have taken more policy courses. There was a, a curriculum that was designed after I graduated 
by um, um, Lynn Kagan um, called the Federal Policy Institute, and it not only studies a lot of um, sort of the ways of thinking about policy and, and government, but also takes students to Washington so that they can interact with and have conversation with um, um, people in D.C. And I say that for two reasons. One is um, there are two books that were really helpful. One of them was Lakoff's Don't Think of an Elephant, um, which was all about framing, right? When I say don't think of an elephant, what do you think about? A damn elephant, right? Um, and so it's really important to understand how it is that arguments and concepts are framed um, and the timing within which things can happen, um, uh, particularly within Washington, D.C. Um, but the second thing is acknowledging that so much of policymaking is about ex accepting that it's a relationship-based business. Um, so being able to, to make those inroads and to develop relationships early, uh, earlier would have also been helpful in hindsight. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. And let me just ask you again because... You know, part of your experience, and when I met you, you were working with um, Senator Harkin. Senator uh, Kennedy. Senator Kennedy. Well, when I first met you, yeah, yeah, I Kennedy. think you were, were you with yeah, Kennedy yeah, when Ke I first Harkin met came you? after Kennedy. Okay. So, following along that policy um, trajectory, what did you learn about shaping policy when you were in D.C.? What are some of the, hmm. what are some of the things that we hear about how policy is shaped, but that, really aren't real? Are there some things that you learned? I'll tell you first something that is real. A lot of people joke that um, uh, many significant decisions are made by 20-year-olds, and that's right. I was a senior policy advisor working for Ted Kennedy. God rest his soul. They don't make him like they used to. Um, at 26 years of age. Um, and he entrusted me with a considerable amount of power, I think much more power than I realized I had at the time. Uh, so that's one thing that's real. Um, in terms of things they don't tell you, I guess related to that, um, I didn't appreciate the process of, of, of policy making. Um, one, staffers are gatekeepers, right? People often go to Capitol Hill and DC and say, I want to speak to the principal, I want to speak to the member. The most important thing that you need to appreciate is that the person at the front desk is often the most important person in that office. Right? He or she is the gateway for how things are moving. They go through the correspondence. They're filled in calls. They have a relationship with everybody in that space. And there are people, mostly staffers, who don't get the shine, but who do a whole lot of the work to make sure that the issues that are important to constituents who are the least likely to ever go to Washington are engaged. So I think about this. The value add of the initiative, the White House Initiative on Educational Excellence for African Americans is that we serve as glue. Not only do we inform the policymaking process, right, and how do we do that? We, one, submit recommendations to legislators on Capitol Hill to tell them to think about things that they might have otherwise neglected to account for, right? So I get to leverage the expertise of 24 members who serve on my president's board of advisors. It's chaired by Freeman Robowski, who's the president of UMBC, one of the most brilliant men that I've ever encountered in my lifetime. Uh, but we get to take their recommendations and share that with our colleagues on Capitol Hill. We also work to ensure that the regulations and the grants, bless you, that are administered by the Department of Education, Labor, Health, and Human Service are also informed and optimized in ways that would benefit our community. But the other thing that we do that's critically important is do this. We have conversations with communities that are least likely to be engaged in those spaces so they understand what's happening and why it matters, right? We talk about why the, 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 the conversations about Common Core or Affordable Care Act that often end up truncated on national news cycles are much more meaningful for people who are impacted by them in ways that they often don't understand. Um, and, and that's something that I think is really hard to um, unpack or to help people make sense of if they've never been to Washington and don't really understand how that process works. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so getting back to the initiative, you know, what do you hope, David, is gonna be sort of the lasting impact? You've talked about it's the glue, yeah. and, uh, but, but what do you feel as the executive director when you turn around five years from now and you look at the impact of this initiative, what do you hope it's going to be? Three things. Um, one, the reframing of the narrative. I, I, it bothers me that uh, with so much brilliance, I meet so many beautiful black kids who are the examples of what it means to be young, gifted, and black every single day. And it bothers me that there are so many people who would say that I don't know that they exist. Mm -hmm. And in the way that we have to wait for these national moments of crisis to acknowledge that like, there are some fundamental issues in our country, it's just wrong. And so the first thing is, is, is finding ways to, 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 to challenge 
um, uh, to disrupt and to supplant these deleterious stereotypes and images and tropes that are recycled and, and reify these barriers. That's one. Um, two, we gotta make education sexy, right? Like, it, it bothers me that the space that everybody should be focused on and celebrating is the one that gets the least amount of attention. If I could paint, I would paint pictures of the moment that I told my friends I was going into education. I would paint the pictures and sell them and make a whole lot of money. Rappers would use them on album covers and everything. Here's why. <laughs> because as a student who was celebrated for being at the top of my class and doing all these wonderful things, at a school, mind you, like Harvard, where we're trained to take over countries and corporations, when I said I'm going to do God's work, people were confused. That's a problem. Mm -hmm. There's not a person among us who can point to individual success without acknowledging that there was some caring adult who at some point said one thing that flipped the switch or made it so that you're like, I, I can do this. I got this. There's a film, the first lady hosted a screening of a film called The Inevitable Defeat of Mr. and Pete. It's a Lionsgate film starring Jennifer Hudson and Jeffrey Wright and a whole bunch of other wonderful people, but it's really the story of a little boy named Mr. When you meet Mr., his teacher is telling him that he doesn't have the skills required to advance to the next grade level. And then his drug addicted prostitute mother gets arrested. And he spends a summer in the projects in New York City, fending for his own life while looking out for his friend. You can't add, but you can figure out life. And this little boy is running, trying to make stuff happen, and he's acting, getting food, all kind of stuff is going on. And one of the most powerful scenes in the film is when he's in the back of a cop car, and he breaks down crying. Right In a world where people say boys don't cry, they tell lies like we don't have emotions, this boy is crying and says, I can't do this on my own. And the reality is that none of us can. But we'll walk past a child who's crying. I get pissed when people say things like shut that baby up. Right? We forget that like, that's the thing that we all should be spending time. There's, there's not a single thing that any of us can do that's more noble than investing in the life of somebody else. Mm -hmm. And we put that last. Mm -hmm. So if I could do anything, it would be to put that first. And the last thing is this, it's, it, it's to challenge this idea that the exception is reality. So, 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 so let's be clear, there are some people who operate with wanton disregard for themselves or others. There are some parents who put their needs above their children's needs even though they didn't ask to be invited into this world. There are some people who abuse, uh, neglect, and sometimes kill kids. There are some people who will set fires while people are trying to protest and do positive work. Those people exist, but they are the exception. The vast majority of people want their children, if nothing else, to have a better life than they've had for themselves. And the challenge is they often don't know how to make that real because they've been disappointed by the same school system or been told by the same teachers that they don't belong in that space. So if I can challenge people to interrogate these ideas that end up allowing us to find comfort in these confined spaces of ignorance and privilege and prejudice, then I would have been successful. Okay, fantastic, fantastic. So one more question and then I want you guys to get ready to ask David a question. So I would suggest that people start to move towards the microphone. Uh, the microphones, there's two. And um, so if you were talking to the faculty here at the ed school um, and had to give us some advice about the kind of places and spaces we should be creating here for students to be able to do this God's works that you talk about, what are what's some of the advice that you would give us for what we need to think about here at this institution? Uh, okay, what, should, what does Harvard need to do? Um, three things. One, uh, brother, what's your name? Jasir. So stand up. Can you see him on that camera? Come here, brother. Come here. So the next time you do a form like this, let him be the speaker. Cool. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and I mean that. Um, um, most people would never think to do that, to give up their own seat so that somebody could sit in it. But the reality is that this young man, sit down. Hi, honey. Try that out. You like that? How are you? The reality is that he's got more expertise than most people in this room. 
So the first thing is to ensure that you, as an institution, leverage this brand to provide platforms to people who need it, mm -hmm. right? That not only helps him to appreciate that this is a space that was created for him. Yeah. In spite of the fact that there were some ignorant people who were stuck in some backward ways at some point in time that made policies that suggested otherwise, this space is intended for you. You're supposed to walk through here and show up and show out and be bad with your bad, beautiful black self. <laughs> You know that, right? <laughs> All right, so I'm gonna let him sit here and we're gonna continue this. So I, 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 I mean that, like y'all laughing and, and that's, cool, that's cool, but I, I mean that. We as adults need to find ways to give these babies our seats. We, we, we're not gonna lose anything. You still got what you got, you still got your swag, but bring somebody with you. Uh, the second thing is similar to that. You're talking to yourselves, only you're doing it yourselves a disservice. In Boston public schools right now, black students and Latino students are suffering. Karen and I traded articles just last week about the disproportionality all across the system, lack of access to AP courses and the types of courses you need in order to be college and career ready. Black girls and Latino girls being pushed out of spaces for demonstrating early the qualities that'll make you successful later in life. Some of y'all missed that. What I'm saying is this. I had a 12-year-old girl. I invited her to the Department of Ed to sit on a panel where we were talking about the, the Department of um, uh, the DOJ data that I mentioned earlier. And I asked her, what's the most important thing that you want to share with all these adults who are here? She's 12. She said, I am strong until I am offensive and then I'm a bitch. The things that make black women successful are women of color, are women, period, successful as professionals, are the exact things that get pushed out of the spaces they're supposed to be in when they're babies. There's a disconnect. Mm -hmm. So the question is, how do you as an institution engage in conversation with people who know better to figure out how to adjust for it? And then the third thing is this. Commit to doing tough work over time. So it's cute to host a forum after something happens nationally and everybody's doing it. That's real cute. They got a picture, I'm gonna do a picture too. They walking up with their hands on the wall. And I'm not saying anything's wrong with it. People need to be aware in whatever way it reaches them. But what are you doing when nobody's looking for you to do the work? So I celebrate that Dean Ryan and others have decided that this is gonna be a conversation that you'll engage in over the next year. What about the next decade? Alfred Woodard was given a talk recently and reminded people that we were a slave economy a lot longer than we've been anything else. Let's spend some time in that space. The last example is this. The president, two years ago, offered uh, one of the most thoughtful conversations we've had publicly about race in this country. Period. He invited all of us to do the work of continuing the discussion. And not only talking about it for the sake of talking about it, but talking to get to a point where we can actually do some work. And the reality is that in that time, we've not done enough. Because then it was Trayvon Martin, now it's Mike Brown. And in between, it's been Renisha and all kind of other people in the mix as well. I was trying to think of the trans sister's name so I could offer up some additional diversity, but it's escaping me at the moment. But the point is that you gotta, you, we have to expect that it's not going to be easy. People are going to be in their feelings. Anticipate it and create a space in which everybody can move through that. But if you can't do that tough work here of making people feel comfortable enough to have difficult conversations that are all about us being better able to do this work, then it's not going to happen. It's not. You have anything to add to this, young sir? We've been talking a whole lot, and I keep referencing you. What do you think about all this that's been going on? I don't really think about it. You don't? <laughs> you think it's important for people to talk about educating black kids? Yes. Why? I'm not sure why. You know why. What's the first thought that came to your head? I'm 
drawing a blank. <laughs> Where do you go to school? Martin Luther King Jr. Holla. <laughs> Where is that? On Broadway. On Broadway, so it's here in Cambridge? Yes. Oh, I know that school. Why is school important school. to you? That'll be my last question, and I'll leave you alone. Because I want to get an ed education. Why do you want to get an education? So that I can go to college. Why do you want to go to college? So that I can have a successful life. Boom. Ooh. Where your mama at? Mama, stand up. There you go, girl. Yeah. Go give your mama a hug. Tell her job well done. Thank you, Jamil. <sighs> Questions from the audience. And Thank you, Janelle. Say who you are. On behalf of all of the brothers yes. of the, the, the Mama's Boys Club, appreciate you. <laughs> yes, hello. I'm Gerald Jean Baptiste. I'm in the Arts and Education Program. I just want to first thank you for your incredible presentation. Yeah. It was empowering. Thank you for coming. And I uh, do want to say one thing. Because we want to get some questions in, please, not a lot of throat clearing, just the question, because I will stop you. No problem. Great. I just want to talk about the last part you mentioned about coming from a neighborhood. Just the question. Yeah. How do we motivate black and Latino boys, adolescents, to be smart even when it's not popular? We make it popular. We, get, I, we make it popular. We value it. We talk about um, and celebrate them when they do the things that they should be doing. It's, instead of showing up only when they're throwing balls, we show up when they are solving equations and building robots. We um, not only push them to engage in extra, extra um, curricular and intramural sports when they're babies, but we compel them to think about engaging in hackathons and building apps to save lives. We were at the Essence Festival this past year, and there's a brother named Kalima Pryforce who runs Kino Labs. They support what is called Yes We Code that's been associated with a lot of the My Brother's Keeper hackathons. The female counterpart to that is Kimberly Bryant's Black Girls um, Code. Uh, but both programs go into communities where children are least likely to have access to the kind of support you need in order to understand coding and help them to develop apps. And the most powerful thing, and, and this is at an event, again, Essence Festival, it's all about like entertainment, but there's this empowerment series as well. This is a thing that should have been in front of everything because young people were designing apps to hack their way out of the challenges that life has given them. The first app had everybody in tears. It was about stopping sex trafficking. Babies in Atlanta, for those who don't know, Atlanta is the hotbed for trafficking of young girls in our country. These babies developed an app. Take pictures, monitor what's going on, send it to the different systems, develop an app about it. The second app, mental health support services and community for kids who've lost their friends to gun violence. They have the answers. Last night, the, the uh, um, attorney general was in Atlanta at a community forum that was designed to talk about what needs to happen in order to strengthen relationships between law enforcement and, and, and kids of color, right? This isn't something that's new. Um, Congresswoman Frederica Wilson did this in Miami to start the 5,000 Role Models of Success program. But again, another example of what happens when you have honest conversation and provide kids with spaces to talk about the things that are important. In short, what I'm saying is that it, it is an um, improbable scenario to think that we can continue valuing the things that we value and operating in the way in which you do and still accept kids to do that which is not cool. right? So we simply need to celebrate that which is. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Cesar. Jody, my name is Cesar Cruz, um, byproduct of LA Unified School District. What? So oh Crenshaw High. Okay. Uh, um, Westchester. Y'all laugh. That's multiple intelligence says being able to read gang signs will save your life. <laughs> you probably heard uh, LAUSC now has a graduation requirement called ethnic studies. What would you say is the national role as we talk about national common core? What's the role of a national ethnic studies movement? So it's important to note that Common Core is not a national mandate. It is a state-led initiative that is about raising standards. <laughs> ethnic studies. Let's focus on ethnic studies. But you mentioned Common Core, brother, so we got to go through it. In part because those things often end up not being dissected and people don't even understand the nuances. Right? I get offended when people are pissed off about Common Core assessments and really talking about standards and not knowing that they're too... Anyway, so... The, 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 the concern I have with the, I, let me back up and not even do it that way. Language, culture, and history are essential, period. Most people don't acknowledge that there are more than one titles in ESEA, but Title um, Seven of ESEA is focused on supporting Native students. There's a provision in there called Esther Martinez, which is about language 
restoration, restoration, reclamation, and preservation. Mm -hmm. Why? Because we know that when Native students understand their culture, have access to their language, and know whose they are and whose they are, they do better. They're happier, they're healthier, they can focus. Duh, right? The same is true for all kids, right? That's why I showed that video about because of them we are. It's why I carry a backpack that says because of them we are, because we all need to know who we are and whose we are. The question is this. If the party that you do not identify with were responsible for drafting the provisions of your ethnic studies curriculum, would you still ask for it? It is sometimes a dangerous thing to ask for people to mandate things federally, especially because the policy, it could be the most beautifully written piece of legislation ever. If people don't understand it and aren't willing to act on it, then it's meaningless. No Child Left Behind didn't come in everybody's classroom and slap people around and say, do this, that, or the other. At all. At best, it provided a framework within which specific sets of conversations were supposed to take place. It was supposed to provide cover for people to push others to do more, better. Same thing with these conversations about language, culture, and identity. All kids need to know who they are and whose they are. That starts at home, but needs to be embedded in schools. So one of the things that we focus on is how to align home culture with school expectations. And that provides us with an avenue to do so. But directly to answer your question about national mandated ethnic studies curriculum, it concerns me. Hi. Um, my question is, how do you stay motivated and what is your recommendations concerning making teachers motivated with some of the statistics that you presented? Because I'm sure a teacher could come in having these statistics and just be like, oh, well, due to all these statistics, this child, you know, sh why should I try? So the most important statistic that I offered, and it, it wasn't a, a, a hard stat, but it was the anecdote, which is in spite of all of the challenges that kids face, in particular poor, minority, disenfranchised kids, they show up anyway. They still go to school. They still do the work. They still deal with the teacher who they know cannot stand them. They still go. That's the thing we all need to walk away with, period. To your first question about motivation, I appreciate that. I didn't get to spend more time in it. But related to my sentiments about this is tough work, and you need to be prepared for that, you got to build your own village. So the three things that I often hold on to is I am a child of God. The longer I live and the more I do this work. And it's a weird thing to think. I'm going to go to work and argue with people about investing in kids. That's just weird. Where they do that at? I got to convince you that it's a benefit to all of us to support the generation of kids who need to make enough money to... Listen. <sighs> it bothers me. I'm, it, clearly, you can tell. The most important thing is to have people around you who will affirm you when you need to be affirmed who will tell you to rest when you need to rest, who will tell you to get off Twitter when you need to put it down. <laughs> uh, I, I joke, but, but, but that's important. I, I, I have um, and still maintain an active crew of educators that whenever I have policy arguments or disagreements that go left, I check in with them. I've also gotten better about, and this is something that I've done only in the last year, I've gotten better about, and this is a lesson Senator Kennedy taught me in his death, about appreciating that as much as I am clear that God has purposed me to do this work, I only got one life to live in this body. So I'm much more thoughtful about attending to my own health. I don't sleep or eat the way that I do, but I'm trying to do better. And I also now spend more time trying to be intentional about carving out time for my friends and the people that I, I care about. Right? Like I'm at the point where people are getting married and having babies and lives are transitioning. Um, and I have neglected a lot of my personal life to ensure that I can invest professionally. Um, and so finding that balance early mm -hmm. and being anchored in some meaningful way, I think, is the most important thing. Mm -hmm. Thanks for that question. Mm -hmm. Yes. Thank you. Um, my question kind of centers around teaching kindergarten, third grade for the last 12 years. So shout out to kindergarten Holla. teachers. Get a man um, round of applause. In, in, in Dorchester. Um, no, listen, people, less than 2% of the workforce look like us, and those of us in the workforce don't work with the babies. Why? Because people got all kind of issues with young men. Listen. I got you. <laughs> so one of the things I've kind of struggled with over the, the years that I've been, and I've been in the same school, in, like I said, in Boston, in Dorchester, how would you go about saying, or what has been your advice to work with bridging kind of the connection with the struggle um, 
you know, the history, where we came from with, with, our, with our generation. So our young black boys, for example, one of the things I find the hardest is trying to connect them to, to like, you know, the past, you know, to the history, where we came from, why this is all so important, yeah. especially with, you know, everything going on, and, you know, nowadays with technology, social media, what's out there, popular culture, what they make is important or what they tell you to think is important. What, how do you find your making that connection with them to bring about, like... So this is the thing that I miss about being in the classroom, is um, I, the connections are all around you. Mm. And, and for me, it was um, trying to find ways to push them to unlock it or to make sense of it, right? So the interesting thing about right now, literally this very moment, is that you don't have to do a whole lot of work to get kids to understand how the riots in Ferguson and at Harvard and, and Antwerp are connected to the riots that we had in LA almost to the day that Michael Brown, the, the riots happened when, when that happened, right? They're literal images, same screenshot, right? Police and tanks, police and tanks. People protesting, people protesting. Kids dead in the street, kids dead in the street. The connections are there, right? And similarly to, to the point that I was attempting to make about the president reminding us that we need we needed to have the conversation then. We still need to have the conversation now. If we don't do it, we're still going to need to have the conversation and more kids are going to die while we move to that space. Uh, essentially, is an acknowledgment that, that, that the connections are, are already there. And, 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 and the sad reality is that we spend more time turning away from them and telling ourselves this lie that we shouldn't be completely honest with kids, which is probably where I should have just started. We spend so much time telling ourselves that like we're saving them by not speaking complete truth to power. I was pissed off when I had friends who were educators in Florissant call me and say that they were discouraged from talking about the death of Mike Brown. And my thing is this, most adults are shocked because they heard of that one death. For most of those kids, that was a fifth or sixth person they lost this year. Mm -hmm. yeah. And if you don't think that they're talking about it, and making connections as to why it's happening and how they feel about it, you are lying to yourself. So the last thing I'll say is that I, we just have to be fully honest with them, invite them into that space. If nothing else, show them the president in, in uh, March of this year when he launched the My Brother's Keeper initiative. Mm -hmm. yep. as, a, as a professional man of color, I, I literally was dumbfounded the entire thing. Being in the White House with the black president standing in front of black and brown boys talking about the challenges that most of us are numb to, Start there and then let them run with it. Thank you. Other questions? Don't be shy. I know this is not a shy group. Yes, sir. Thank you. Um, do you think that, I I've, I've, haven't asked this question in the past very well, so I'm going to try and ask it better now, but do you think that by focusing so much in education on standards and achievement and excellence, that we sort of neglect some of these underlying challenges a little bit that you've been talking about all day? I reject the premise, which is to suggest that we have to do either or. My entire life is that we should not be subjected to the tyranny of either or, but celebrate the both and, right? It, it's adults who get caught up in what a letter and an acronym means. Like, I have, I have debates with colleagues about STEM versus STEAM. I've never been in a classroom where a lesson was going on and kids were engaged and they were like, stop, stop, stop. Is this the A or the T? I just really want to know. They just want to be engaged. It's adults who get caught up in the, is it the standards that are going to do it, or is it the assessments that are going to make the difference? Is it the they just simply want to be engaged. They want to know that it's relevant. They want to know that at some point in life, it's going to add value to the things that they need to overcome. Right? They want to be able to demonstrate that, that, that they can add their own flavor or interpretation to it. And, and, and that's about us sort of moving past the things that often end up being barriers in the way. So yes, if we get caught up in the very surface level conversations that bifurcate being able to do all that's required to accept that kids are whole people, it's not just academic, but it's developmental, right? It's not only cognitive, but it's social and emotional. If we get caught up in one or the other, most definitely we do everybody a disservice. Does that answer your question? Thank you. Yes, Angela. Hi. Um, thank you so much. And uh, I wanted to pick up um, a little bit on some of the themes uh, because I feel like you've shared so much around um, the primacy of the teacher in front of the child, us adults in front of the child, how we need to sort of sit in the discomfort, 
what have you, be present and really engage young people. I wonder if you could just say a little more about the policy piece in terms of does that, how does that move the needle or not um, in terms of some of the things you've been talking about this evening? Are there one or two key policy opportunities that excites you or concerns you? A moment ago, you were a little bit concerned about the ethnic studies policy yeah, piece. Yeah. Is there, what else is on your mind? Yeah, I appreciate the question. I'll talk about two um, and, and name some of the, um, the members of the President's Board of Advisors that I mentioned earlier. Um, so two of our members are Barbara Bowman. Um, many of you might know her. She's associated with Erickson in Chicago. Um, and James Jim Comer, uh, the father of uh, childhood development at Yale. Um, and the two of them are really um, helping us to think through and really work within the Department of Education and across both with Health and Human Services and, and Justice um, 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 how to help everybody, including educators, understand and be able to act upon the importance of development. Too many of us simply just focus on learning without acknowledging the relationship to development, mm -hmm. which is separate but is very much a part of this process. And that includes everything from the environmental factors that kids are born into when they then come home, to the language and literacy access that they then have, and the way that they end up engaging with those who should be caring and concerned adults. So that's the first one. And that has everything to do with acknowledging that a child's first and most important educator are his or her parents. And then what happens with educators, uh, formally or otherwise, as they're prepared to do that work. Uh, the second thing, um, and this work is being led by um, Becky Pringle, who's um, a woman of color who's in leadership within the National Education Association, um, Evelyn Hammonds, who's a faculty member here, um, and a few other members. Um, but it's really digging into um, proposed regulatory changes around um, higher education's teacher prep programs. So this is literally the support system given to those of you who are thinking about going into the system. Um, so we are now looking at that as some 400 pages of proposed changes to this bill. And this is, again, anticipating that HEA as well as ESEA, the bill that most people refer to um, as No Child Left Behind, will be up for reauthorization in a Republican-controlled Congress, which presents a lot of um, opportunities for discussion and discourse. Let's just put it there. Um, Y'all yeah, know how it works for it. Um, uh, but that's sort of the second space and is the one that's much more aligned with the, the conversation we're, we're having now. And so look for some recommendations from our commission um, about how it is that those regulations might be even tightened, um, again, with a specific focus on uh, poor, disenfranchised, and minority children. Uh, but again, those are only two examples of a number of conversations we're having in that space. But I appreciate the question. Thank you. Hi, uh, my name's Elena. You sort of started touching on the question that I have, which is, um, as one of those people who's beginning to, who was a practitioner who's beginning to see that policy impacts everything, which is what you were talking about, um, my question is really around what that looks like because policy is a set of guidelines, as you said, and it's really the implementation where it matters. So what do you see as the role of policy makers in ensuring that implementation is effective? So one, it's important not to separate the two. So even in the way in which you described it, it suggested that one was a responsibility of one and the other was a responsibility of somebody else, and that's the exact opposite, right? And, and part of the problem with how um, 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 we call it unintended consequences, often the result um, that leads to, or the thing that leads to unintended consequences is a separation of the, he who drafted and she who implements. I probably should have inverted that so you didn't think that I was biased. Anyway, uh, the, the, the point here is that the two very much are in concert and need to be at all times, right? And you need to be thinking about the process of crafting legislation, understanding how it's going to be interpreted and implemented, right? So the example I offered about needing to understand what it's like being in a school, a classroom, or a system allows you to do exactly that, right? Like you can sit in a room and imagine a world any way you want to, right? And if you're a director of a movie, if you say there's no gravity, there's no gravity. But the reality is in Dorchester, where the brother's teaching these kids, there's gravity. And understanding that and being able to talk about the relationship between the two makes all the difference in the world. Does that answer your question? It made a follow-up question, but thank you. Tweet me. I, I'm, I'm scared of tweet, but no, yeah. no, we'll teach Time her. Time out. We'll teach her. We'll See, teach her. we'll teach her. We'll teach her. Because we'll what I want to ask is if you taught science, because it's my you, you, we can't be scared of the things that enable us to reach people. How you teach science and you scared of technology? <laughs> Y'all laughing, but I'm serious. Right? We can't do that. Twitter is a tool. 
Tweeting is Don't a get tool. Don't about Twitter. Jesus, the offense all around me. Yes, ma'am. Yes, um. <laughs> you going to talk, ma'am. You're going to tweet before this year is over. Yes, uh, uh, my name is over. Nikita. I, I refer to myself as a structured out professional. So there's a no term now. There's a no phenomenon that is occurring where uh, older teachers, veteran teachers are being placed out, kicked out of the classroom. So this is how I introduce myself, uh, a structured out uh, veteran educator. Um, my question is, I mean, I, let, me, let me say something before I pose well, my no, no, question. Well, no, 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 because we're, we're running out of time, and okay. I'd like to get All the right. sister's question in okay. before we go, so if I you will. could ask it right out, I'd okay. appreciate it. Okay, let, let me just say, uh, when we say African Americans, are we implying all Af people of African descent? So it's not only African Americans from the South, because that dialogue tends to be nuanced, you know? Yeah, I use a so, capital so A, we, capital A. Okay, so we are implying... All, Everybody who got off the ship, no matter where it stopped. All people of African descent. Yes. Okay. And also, I want to I want to ask that since the question is uh, the the discourse is around Boston or the urban areas, and I also would like to pause that: Do we care? Do we see that the Ferguson that Ferguson had given us an example that the issues are present in small towns, in medium towns, in medium cities? So it's not only in yeah, the urban definitely. areas. So I'm yeah. just hoping that we are. Or paying attention now to I, what I is was, happening. I, in I was smaller. intentional about making the statement earlier, but I appreciate the invitation to go back. The, the challenges that often get celebrated as belonging only to major metropolitan spaces often show up in small, rural, and isolated communities as well. Some would argue that they're even further exacerbated because you have fewer resources with which you can try and mitigate those challenges. So to both of your questions, yes. Okay. We have to be as broad and as inclusive as possible. Okay, not just One of the things that's allowed areas. us to, to, to your first point about acknowledging the diversity and the diversity diaspora, mm -hmm. the uh, president's recent um, actions around um, immigration um, and, and, and primarily around dreamers um, has allowed us to be able to have some of those conversations, to be able to highlight for people that some of us look a certain way but are still a part of this diaspora mm -hmm. community um, and work better together. So we spent a lot of time, um, my initiative and the initiative focused on Hispanic um, mm -hmm. excellence, mm -hmm. working together, acknowledging that many of us exist in the center of the Venn diagram. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. One last question, quickly. Okay. Um, so my name is Denise. I'm in the Doctorate in Educational Leadership Program. And you talked about post-secondary success as being something that should be celebrated from birth. Can you talk about some of the problems and solutions that your your office or your area has put forth with bridging the gap from yes. high school to college and increasing um, the persistence and graduation rates for African Americans? Yes, of course. Students? Three. One is uh, highlighting the importance of organizations that serve to facilitate that transition. Um, so I uh, wasn't able to show it, but there's a clip um, from an organization of brothers who were young and brilliant um, called Striving Black Brothers. They're at Chabot College, which is a junior college in um, Northern California. Um, and this is an institution that has developed a program to respond to the students who are least likely to, to move through and to either persist and complete the degree or to transfer to a four-year institution. Mm -hmm. It's a program that a brother started using money out of his own pocket that literally brings together these young men so that they support one another and hold each other accountable to complete. There's a corollary program called the Coalition of Schools Educating Boys of Color that's located here in Boston that supports similar programs that start as early as elementary school that also helps us to understand the importance of needing to be thoughtful about the entire spectrum mm -hmm. and those transition points where our kids often fall through the cracks. That's one. The second thing is highlighting all of the resources that exist to support this enterprise. So we are in the process of developing a toolkit there's also mm -hmm. multiple resources that exist. You can find them on our website. There's a FAFSA guide um, for students. Uh, but our, our toolkit is designed for students who are figuring out this college thing for the first time, mm -hmm. right? So we have to appreciate, and the First Lady's done a whole lot of work in this regard, that for many of us, this whole first generation thing is serious, mm -hmm. right? There's a video um, it sort of builds on the It Gets Better campaign where the First Lady tells a story of going to Princeton and packing to, to get ready to go to college. And, Nobody in her family had gone to Princeton, so she's got her little sheets and she got a little twin set and she shaking it out and it didn't fit on the bed. Why? Because at these schools they got extra long twins. But if you didn't have anybody that went to college, you wouldn't know that. So for her first year, she slept with her long legs touching the plastic on the extra long twin bed. The sentiment there is, if you can walk through gang territories or deal with being hungry or have watched abuse or been neglected, sleeping on bed with plastic is the easy thing, right? But we have to tell those stories 
so our babies don't think that they're either invisible or the first people having to deal with these challenges, otherwise they might think break them. The last thing is encouraging and imploring institutions like Harvard, who are exemplars of leading everything. This is, I hear well, you can tell this is hard for me, huh? <laughs> I hear we and I went to Columbia together. So all this Harvard talk is a little challenging. <laughs> um, but, but, but the work here is really in, 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 in doing things like providing um, um, financial support for students who can't afford it and, 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 and finding other ways to uh, acknowledge and, and, and mitigate some of the challenges that we've discussed um, thus far. Um, the opportunity is in, in, in working with other institutions to help them learn from and to also help you guys get better. So there's a way that, in the same way that I talked earlier about researchers only talking to researchers, there's a way in which sometimes we only talk to the schools that we meet at tailgates and homecoming. But it's really important for Harvard, thinking about leading the country and educating the brightest minds, to be doing so in concert with institutions that don't normally factor into this picture, right? This whole, we're only doing this for ourselves and it's not a village thing and we don't belong to this community is the exact opposite of what we should be doing. So in a time when so many people are struggling to articulate their own frustrations or feelings, good, bad, or otherwise, I can't tell you how many people I've blocked in the last week because they want to tell me how they feel, right? At a time in which people are more inclined to sit in that space, you got to just do it, commit to it, acknowledge that it's going to be difficult, bring the tissues, put Iyala on the back, right? But really sit in figuring out how it is that you do that, which is otherwise easy to not do. That's, I, I think if there's one thing that ties everything that I'm trying to say together, it's that like we have to do that which nobody else wants to do. Right? And, and y'all have already demonstrated by being here at 7 o'clock on a Tuesday that you're willing to do it. So the last thing I'll just say is take care of yourself as you continue to do this work because it's not going to happen overnight. We signed up to invest our lives to do this work. But it's valuable and it's essential. Right? And if my reminder isn't enough, I hope his is. Well, one of the things that I love about my friend David is that he does uh, speak truth and uh, speaks from the heart. And we are going to have a reception across the uh, way in Gutman, and I would encourage you to join us there from 7 to 8. But I would like us all to acknowledge David's uh, heart and head and soul and what he shared with us tonight. Don't do that. Just teach a baby. And go out and do the work. That's right. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.